Today, uh, we have Ravi Madan as our first speaker talking about prostate cancer. So he's clinical director of the uh, urogenitory branch. And um, he, would, he got his MD from New Jersey Medical School. And then he completed his residency at the University Hospital and he joined the NCI Medical Oncology Branch in 2005 and currently holds a joint appointment between the Medical Oncology Branch and Tumor Laboratory of Tumor Immunology and Biology. So he's exploring immunotherapy treatments in rare tumors such as medullary thyroid cancer. And the title of his talk today is Treatment for Metastatic Prostate Cancer. Ravi. Thanks. So yeah, we hope the uh... We hope the uh, hurricane really doesn't cause as much damage as they're concerned about. We'll get through this lecture with hopefully less damage as well. Um, most of my day job is actually centered around prostate cancer and, and developing immunotherapy strategies in this tumor type. However, that will not be really at all a focus of this talk as immunotherapy makes up a very small niche, although I will, I will touch on that a little bit. So after like these first two slides, if you need to like pretend that your experiment's failing and you have to leave or go pick up your kids, it's probably reasonable because I'll hit on all the approved therapies and I'll give you all the background later on. But I think these first couple slides will really lay the groundwork for the rest of the talk. So this is kind of the clinical course for prostate cancer where patients are diagnosed and potentially uh, uh, cured early on. Unfortunately, even patients who are um, treated with curative intent, roughly 20 to 40% will recur. At that point in time, as we'll talk about, hormone suppression is really the primary way to contain their disease. And when that fails, then we have some other options. But this was the treatment landscape really until about seven or eight years ago. And the only thing that worked besides either chemical or surgical castration was uh, a dose of Taxol, which is a chemotherapy or taxane-based chemotherapy. And that extended survival by a few months based on the medians um, of, of a study, which I'll show you that data later. So for a while, there really were not a lot of options for these patients. However, we're fortunate to have had a lot of advances in the last seven or eight years, and I'll share them with you here, and you'll see this landscape gets very much more crowded. So actually, even though their immunotherapy is all the rage now, the first kind of modern immunotherapy beyond like just cytokines, uh, like IL-2 and interferon, was actually approved in prostate cancer. It's a vaccine that's been somewhat debated over time, although I believe the phase three data, and I'll share that with you shortly, but it's called Cipolucil T, and it's used in this kind of early metastatic setting. Shortly thereafter, a second line taxane agent after the first line uh, taxane agent, Vazitaxel, was developed and demonstrated an improve, improvement in survival, followed by two anti-androgen therapies. Uh, and we'll come to why blocking the androgens are still relevant, even though they've already been chemically or surgically castrated. Um, in the years that follow, these agents demonstrated efficacy in improving survival even before chemotherapy, um, followed by an agent called radium-223, which is an infusional radio pharmaceutical agent. So it's really interesting. It, prostate cancer probably doesn't get as much publicity for being an exciting kind of tumor type, but you see over a relatively short period of time, we had several therapies approved that really crowded this landscape. And they're not just... Uh, therapies. They're, they're different modalities. You've got radiation-based therapies, immunotherapy, anti-androgen therapies, ke and chemotherapies. And with all this um, opportunity, a lot of this has been investigated in earlier stage disease. And um, to that end, enzalutamide, as well as a newer version of enzalutamide called apalutamide, were, were used in patients kind of before the metastatic development of disease in patients who are castration resistant. And I'll share that data with you at the end if we have time, but this was just approved this year. So again, you see how this landscape has become very crowded. And then looking at a little bit earlier stage of disease, so these are patients who are diagnosed with metastatic disease and do not undergo surgery or radiation with curative intent, or they had that many years ago and then come back to their doctors and then have metastatic disease, but normal testosterone. There have been studies that demonstrated that moving two agents, docetaxel, and abiraterone to this earlier stage of newly diagnosed patients demonstrated a survival advantage. But again, these are patients who are diagnosed with METs as opposed to this 
slide, which is patients who are diagnosed with localized disease. That's really the big difference here. So you can make a notation of that. So what I'm going to do with the allotted time left is try to go through all these different therapies, the trials that led to their approval, their relative toxicity, and um, hopefully give you a better understanding of where we've been so we can hopefully figure out what the next steps are. So let's start, to start off with some necessary basics uh, of understanding. So what is castration-resistant prostate cancer, or CRPC? So this is cancer that grows despite castrate levels of testosterone. So I mentioned that chemical or surgical castration is the first way to intervene in this disease, and that's because testosterone fuels the growth. And, um, but that only works to contain the cancer for a, a relatively short period of time, uh, on average maybe only one or two years in a given patient, although much longer in the individual patient uh, is possible. But at some point, either it's going to grow based on imaging or PSA. And at that point, when you have evidence of cancer growth through either of these two aspects, uh, despite castrate levels of testosterone, it is castration resistant. It is not uh, androgen independent, which is an older term. You'll see that actually through mechanisms of resistance, androgens still very much drive these disease and targeting the androgen receptor is still very much a relevant target. So that gets us to this next slide, which is why do we use anti-androgen therapies in patients who are castration resistant? And that is because these resistant mechanisms that develop that drive castration resistance are often AR mediated. And so you could see amplification of the androgen receptor, which I think speaks for itself, but also secondary production of androgens. So this could occur from other glands, um, such as the adrenal gland, and that's relevant because most of the chemical castration or surgical castration really only addresses testicular production of testosterone, but not other tissues within the body. But also, in a very kind of sinister way, cancer cells can produce their own androgens. That's a relatively new understanding over the last five or 10 years. So there's the secondary production of androgens within the tumor microenvironment that actually leads to an autocrine or paracrine uh, driven tumor growth. So that's why blocking these pathways are still relevant in patients who are castration resistant. There's also mechanisms by which uh, splice variants or uh, drive growth of prostate cancer or ligand independent growth pathways. This essentially means that despite a, a, an androgen receptor uh, pathway that is triggered leading to cellular proliferation and growth, it may be irrelevant whether or not there's something bound to that ligand. Because of a, a splicing change, the ligand actually isn't required for that pathway's activation. And that's something we'll touch on briefly as well and its clinical implications. And there can be other downstream effects. So despite the fact that these patients are castration resistant, many of them are still have AR or androgen receptor driven tumors. Um, it's also worth noting that there are mutations in prostate cancer. I know this is kind of, there's some discussion about mutational burden. It's thought that prostate cancer doesn't have a lot, but it looks like, you know, it's, there are obviously mutations in a patient with cancer. In this study that was published in 2015, the average patient had three and a half, I think, mutations. And the most surprising outcome here was that some of these are uh, DNA damage repair mutations in roughly a third of these patients, which can be targeted. But obviously, you can see the preponderance or androgen receptor uh, mutations, but also things like uh, P53 and P10 as well. And then finally, it's worth noting one last aspect of the house rules of treating prostate cancer, and that is even though you'll hear controversies about PSA screening, it is not a controversy in following patients who have cancer. Um, but what is a little bit tricky is how that plays into your management of patients. What has been accepted both here in our group led by Bill Dayhut for probably more than 10 years and externally for about that period of time through the prostate cancer working group and the citation is here, is that PSA is not the sole marker of progression. If you have a patient on a therapy, uh, if their PSA is rising, it should not be their sole determinant of treatment failure. And in, in reality, from a personal standpoint, it's like the third or fourth on my list, radiographic progression should be the primary evidence that a treatment is failing in a patient with radiographic evidence of disease. Um, obviously, symptoms uh, and, and to tolerability of the given therapy also play into account. But just because you have a rising PSA and you're managing a patient with prostate cancer, um, that doesn't mean the treatment is failing or that you should move on to your next therapy. So um, this actually becomes very relevant 
because we don't know the optimal treatment sequence in prostate cancer. I showed you that crowded landscape and it made it look like, well, maybe there's if this, then that. There really isn't. And what I've seen sometimes in some patients who are referred to us, there seems to be a, 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 a sense of, well, we've got a lot of options here, so your PSA is going up on this. Let's just stop this and try another therapy because we have these different options. And in reality, that could shortchange the clinical benefit to the patient because a lot of the trials that demonstrated these patients improved survival primarily relied on radiographic free progression. That's really true for all the trials that I'll talk about except for the docetaxel trials, which um, predated that recommendation. So we don't have a clear treatment sequence, and ongoing trials are evaluating these the current treatments either in sequence or combination. So in the absence of that, I will go through each of these treatments and propose what at least is my opinion on how these agents could be sequenced. Now, it's not a flow chart. It, you'll find that it largely depends on the patient you're looking at in the clinic. And that is, you know, um, their personal preferences uh, come into play, the, how the side effects of the given treatment interplays with their existing comorbidities, as well as how fast their disease is moving and how symptomatic they are. Um, I'm, in a patient who's got a lot of symptoms, you may be inclined to use chemotherapy early on, but in a patient who does not, you may have other options. And again, so there's not a strict flow chart. Um, there's not an algorithm, which is I know what everybody would like to have, but hopefully what I'll present to you is a, is a rational approach, but realize this is my opinion and really there's no hard data to support uh, this, this strategy. So for a few years now, I've used this menu approach. We, uh, we're almost at dinner time, so uh, hopefully it, uh, it doesn't get anyone too hungry, but generally it kind of lays out your treatment options in how I, I think one way to view it as you look at a patient going through the natural history of prostate cancer in, in metastatic disease. So we're focused on metastatic disease today. I'm not a radiation oncologist or a surgeon, so I defer those curative intent therapies to, to them. But these are how we contain the disease once we realize it's spread beyond the pelvis and is no longer curable. So I kind of highlighted here these different options again, and I'll work through this. Hopefully this will make sense to you. But it lays out kind of the different possible options and how you can line them up in a given patient. And uh, we'll start off with Cipolucil T here, which is the immunotherapy in prostate cancer. And it's an appetizer, so appetizers aren't for everyone. Um, and it's not going to fill you up, and I'm going to carry this analogy too far. I'm sorry if I haven't already. If I have already, but but it's, it's not going to be sufficient for the whole meal. But I think that in some patients it may be a nice a nice added thing that it, that does convey benefit. So this is preferentially used in patients who have early metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, minimal symptoms, and kind of a low volume or low pace of disease. So this is a therapy, it's actually an immunotherapy that's derived from a patient's own peripheral immune cells. So when this treatment was developed, what they did was they took a patient's white blood cells through leukapheresis, which were collected, send them to a central processing facility where they're ex exposed to a uh, combination of GMCSF, which is a cytokine, as well as prostatic acid phosphatase, which is a relative uh, antigen target on prostate cancer cells. And then after two or three days of immunologic boot camp, if you will, exposure of your immune cells um, to this, this milieu, it's infused back into the patient. A full course of therapy consists of three infusions done every two weeks, and that's it. You're done. One month's uh, work. Um, and this is uh, the design of the, actually, uh, the third phase three trial that was done with this agent. Um, you can see that there was a placebo-controlled uh, uh, component. Um, Although they were looking at progression based on earlier phase three data, they, the primary endpoint was really a survival advantage. You see it was a 500 patient trial. So this was the result of this trial. Um, it was a result that basically demonstrated uh, statistically significant four month improvement in survival that is also clinically meaningful. I, I think that people get caught up in, uh, in looking at this data and like, well, what does only four months mean? Remember, this is a median. So you'll see other trials demonstrate similar efficacy, especially uh, in their initial phase three trials. So this was actually approved in, like I said, in 2010 by the FDA, but controversy surrounded this. And that's really because there were no changes in PFS or progression-free survival in the short term in these patients. And you can see that here by these Kaplan-Meier curves, which show that basically if you're gonna die, unfortunately, in the first six months, this treatment might not have benefited you. But if you live longer, 
it seemed to have done that. And also PSA declines were uncommon. Now fast forward about almost a decade, and in immunotherapy, we see cross, uh, immunotherapy trials have uh, Kaplan-Meier curves that cross over, and people are like, oh yeah, immunotherapy takes time. But when you said that in 2010, no one believed it. And for, for, for these reasons, it's a very split camp on whether or not people believe this data. Personally, I do. There was actually another phase three trial that demonstrated uh, the same survival advantage. It was, it was smaller, but um, so I do recommend this for patients with early stage disease uh, with minimal symptoms. Again, I think there is a hint here that if things are moving quickly, it's not gonna benefit you. So again, there's also data from this trial that showed that patients with lower PSAs had a greater delta benefit in terms of survival. So what this is showing you in red is basically the benefit uh, of, or the survival in months of patients treated um, with the cipollucil T versus the control based on PSA uh, quartiles from the study. Now PSA is not a perfect marker of tumor burden, so I, I think we have to take a little bit with a grain of salt, but nonetheless, I think this is telling us that patients, again, with lower tumor burden, and one of the requirements for the study was not to have a lot of symptoms, you know, these patients had a delta in their survival relative to the control group, that's pretty substantial here. And for those people who didn't think the 26 months was imp impressive in terms of survival, maybe they're more convinced by that. So, you know, who to use this in? I think there are hints of this again. The, the label kind of hints that we shouldn't be uh, using it in high volume disease, and uh, I'm sorry, high symptom disease, and then perhaps lower PSAs, lower tumor burden, hints at maybe who, which patient should benefit or could benefit from this. But again, um, you're not going to expect to see PSA declines. My recommendation, again, there's not hard data on this, but my recommendation is if you're going to use this therapy, go ahead and give it and then move on to your next treatment. Um, there are side effects here, but they're pretty minimal. Chills, fatigue, nausea, headache. I mentioned the, 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 the strokes just because it was something that was talked about with the initial phase three. It really is not something that's come out uh, in a substantial way in subsequent trials, so I don't think it's actually a big deal. This, this treatment's very well tolerated. So again, I recommend it for patients who have early metastatic disease, but it, things are moving slowly and they have the opportunity to do that. But once you're done with your appetizer, you just move on to the first course, you know, because you know it's not gonna fill you up. And I think that, again, we're looking at patients now who either have gotten cipollucil T and are moving on, or patients maybe with more minimal to moderate symptoms. And in, in these type of patients, so, so what does this mean, minimal to moderate? I, I think it is, again, kind of a judgment call, but if you have a patient with pain symptoms and they don't require regularly scheduled narcotics, then I think you know, um, they're probably reasonable candidates for either of these therapies, both of which demonstrated a survival advantage in this population, as well as the ability to mitigate pain. So I think that <clears throat> of these two options, we'll talk about enzalutamide first, and I think, again, it, it's good for patients who, who have some some symptoms, but not substantial, and again, a relatively low to moderate pace of the disease. Um, abiraterone also demonstrates clear efficacy in this population. The one difference between enzalutamide and abiraterone is that in order to mitigate some of the side effects of abiraterone, you have to take prednisone up to 10 milligrams a day. So considering that patients may have stable disease on these therapies for two years, my bias is a little bit towards enzalutamide, um, in terms of which would be preferential because then you don't necessarily have to have your patient on steroids for the, that period of time. Um, but there is no head-to-head -head data as to which is better. So again, I'm just giving you my, my uh, opinion and hopefully the rationale for it. So, so what is enzalutamide? It is an, a small molecule that binds to the androgen receptor, which we already said is an important mechanism by which prostate cancer grows. Androgens bind to the androgen receptor, leads to kind of a signal transduction cascade, leading to uh, nuclear signal uh, for growth and proliferation. So what we see here uh, compared to older androgen receptor antagonists such as bicalutamide, MDV3100, which was the original name for enzalutamide, has greater binding affinity to the androgen receptor, but also has downstream effects in terms of nuclear import and DNA binding and uh, coactivator recruitment. So it's just mu a much better version of something that was but multiple agents that were developed in the 80s and are well, actually more of the 80s. So enzalutamide essentially is a better mousetrap that was built. It's a multi-billion dollar drug 
So if you think you can improve on something that's already being done, go for it. It can actually pay off and help millions of people. Um, the older versions of androgen receptor antagonists actually did not clearly demonstrate a, uh, a survival advantage on their own or with androgen suppression. So it was, it, was, it was pretty exciting when this drug came out about a little over maybe uh, 10 years ago. And again, it, it changed our understanding of this. It, made, it reminded us that even in castration-resistant disease, the androgen receptor, as I've stated, is still a relevant target. So you'll see that a lot of the initial studies were done after patients had progressed on docetaxel, which was at the time the only standard therapy, but also realized uh, that this was also the quickest path to market for this agent. So it made biologic sense in some ways based on the treatment landscape, but it also made good marketing sense to, to get your answer quicker. And you'll see the timelines are much shorter in these studies. So in this placebo-controlled trial of patients who had already had the one standard therapy, Enzalutamide clearly demonstrated a survival advantage. Uh, again, you're seeing it's about uh, three or four months, um, and also a clear evidence of time to progression or, uh, of eight months versus three months, and was approved in 2012 for patients who had already progressed on docetaxel. Now, again, I'm going to show you a lot of data. I wouldn't cross-compare these survival timelines. Again, they're done in sort of different epochs, and sometimes in different populations. So it's just, uh, it's worth kind of having that caveat really across all these lectures probably. Now, once they had demonstrated that, they had already developed trials that were running in patients who were chemotherapy naive. They wanted to demonstrate that it could also improve their survival, and in fact it did. And you see the timelines here are much more because you're getting them much earlier in the disease process. So yes, they're probably extending the life, but there's also what, what could be called a lead time bias here by getting them much earlier. Um, so this survival advantage uh, was, was, was also evident based on this. Uh, you see there's a 12-month progression-free survival advantage. So um, any, any thoughts as to why this is so much shorter than what we saw with, in the post-chemo setting? Any, any quick stabs at that? So it's always important to look at these trials and understand you know, the potential confounding variables when, when analyzing this. And you'll see this with other data as well. But this is very important to understand that this is a crossover effect. Not a deliberate necessarily part of the study design, although I think it may have been. But essentially, if you, didn't, if you got placebo initially and ultimately progressed, you could have gotten chemotherapy and then gotten enzalutamide, which was already approved as standard of care. So even though these patients on these trials were randomized initially to placebo, that doesn't mean they never got these agents later on. So that's why it's not like enzalutamide only improves survival by two months. That would be an inappropriate way to look at this. It, it just highlights that maybe getting it earlier was better for some of these patients. So just worth understanding. Enzalutamide is actually pretty well tolerated. Really, the biggest thing here is fatigue. And remember, I'm highlighting these things not because I think you have to memorize them all or whatever. I just think that the relative toxicities plays into the choices of the therapies for the patients in the absence of clear data of how to sequence this. So fatigue is really the biggest side effect. It can be profound in some patients. In some patients, they don't notice it at all. Um, but generally speaking, enzalutamide is a very well-tolerated drug. There was some concern that patients with seizure history or recent strokes should be uh, excluded from treatment. Um, uh, and, and there's some evidence that perhaps uh, enzalutamide, because of CNS pen penetration, lowers the seizure threshold in these patients. Um, so you should be cautious with patients on anti-seizure medications. Um, there has been a recent study that demonstrated that in patients at high risk for seizures, that the incidence was actually pretty low with enzalutamide. But I think it's something to bear in mind again. You know, maybe if someone had a stroke 10 years ago, I'm not as worried. But if they come to my office and they had a stroke three months ago, or they're on a lot of medications that could induce seizures if the seizure threshold was changed, then I might consider uh, an alternate therapy, such as abiraterone, which I'll talk about uh, now. So again, relative contraindications for a given patient. So the only real big drawback of the abiraterone is that its side effect profile is a little bit more extensive, and I'll share that with you. Um, and it requires the, the daily prednisone to, again, minimize the side effects from the agent itself. So abiraterone is not an androgen receptor a blocker. It blocks the six, CYP17 uh, hydroxylase and, and lyase um, basically 
The lyase, however, is what's more responsible to, for this secondary androgen production. So remember I said one of the resistance mechanisms that we have in prostate cancer is that basically cancer cells or other cells within the tumor microenvironment produce secondary androgens. So even though you're suppressing testosterone from the testicle with either chemical or surgical castration, which is kind of the frontline therapy, there's still this fuel floating around near the cancer cells that leads to their growth. So abiraterone inhibits, uh, through these enzymes, the secondary production. So this is also something that was sort of a better mousetrap probably of an older drug called ketoconazole, an antifungal agent that probably nonspecifically attacked these, or attached these enzymes. So again, just so you know, if you want to, you know, be rich or scientifically famous, you, you can, again, build a better mousetrap. It does work. And that's probably what this is, is an update of a very older, less prostate-specific drug. So when this was developed, again, early studies, just like with enzalutamide, were very promising. All the, the majority of patients had PSA declines, which was a good preliminary marker of efficacy. And this was a phase three trial that was done, again, in patients who had already progressed on docetaxel. And we see, again, there's a survival advantage here of about four months in this late-stage disease population. Um, and this led to FDA approval in patients who had already, again, received docetaxel. This all happened relatively, again, the same time as, as the uh, enzalutamide development. So it's not like they had to randomize against one or another because neither of them were necessarily standard when the trials were developed. Again, you see an advantage in the time to progression uh, as well as the PSA responses. This is a follow-up study just like what the, uh, the group with uh, uh, enzalutamide did, the company there. They ran an abiraterone study in patients who were chemotherapy naive. And again, you saw a, a extensive improvement in median survival here of about, uh, in this, at this iteration in 2015, it was about 10 months relative to the placebo. And again, it's FDA approved now for all patients with metastatic disease, regardless of previous chemotherapy. The side effect profile you see is a little more populated here. So you just bear that in mind when you have your patients. It can, because of the, uh, the CYP17 hydroxylase inhibition, lead to some edema and hypertension. Uh, the edema often manifests itself in lower extremity edema. To some degree, the steroids are supposed to mitigate those side effects, but again, having steroids on board can contribute to other things like hyper hyperglycemia. So if you have a diabetic and they're kind of, it's hard to control their sugars, you don't want to necessarily give them abiraterone if you don't have to, because maybe the prednisone is going to make their uh, glycemic control uh, more difficult. But again, abiraterone may be preferential in some patients who have extreme fatigue with enzalutamide or as we talked about, the seizure risk issues. Um, so why is this relevant? Why am I talking like you can only use one of these therapies? Well, in some ways, there's, a, there's data that's come out in recent years that says that there is cross resistance between these two therapies. And so patients who get one of these agents are likely to benefit but if they get the second agent, they may not, or that benefit may be substantially diminished based on the phase three data that I showed you. And that makes sense, because basically, these are very good inhibitors of the androgen receptor pathway, either at a production level or at activation level. And so the resistance mechanisms that impact one therapy are gonna probably impact both. And so one of the ones that's actually been very extensively studied is this concept I mentioned earlier, which is this concept of the androgen receptor splice variant. So again, these are androgen, um, receptors that post-translationally uh, are modified uh, or spliced in a manner that basically they don't have a receptor. So you don't necessarily need androgens floating around to have it have the, re the receptor be active. So it's almost like having a light switch, but the switch is broken and the wires are crossed, leaving the lights on all the time. It's a weak analogy, but it's the best I can come up with for this time, so hopefully it's okay. But, but uh, basically what this means is that even if you block the, the androgen receptor or the light switch or, or diminish the ability for the body to, or the cancer cells to produce their own testosterone, it doesn't matter because that, 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 that wiring is already crossed because of the splicing, alternative splicing, and that pathway is going to be constituently active. So this is probably, this is definitely not the only mechanism of resistance, but it's one example, and it kind of uh, got a lot of uh, good appropriately got a lot of uh, notoriety based on this New England Journal publication from Dr. Antenna Rockets and his group at Hopkins a few years back with the splice variant known as ARV7, so that's angiogen, angiogen, 
androgen receptor variant 7. And so what you see here is patients treated with enzalutamide. If they had previous apparatus, which you can see from the arrows, and they were ARV7, which is the gold bars, they were very unlikely to respond to abiraterone when they, when they received it after enzalutamide. Similar, uh, similar, you see the same thing in patients who had abiraterone up front and went on to get enzalutamide. But it's also worth noting that you know, not everybody had this, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how relevant this is, but this is not the only um, mechanism of resistance. So this is why you are somewhat limited um, to using both these agents. So you're probably going to get a much longer run out of one than the other, it, depending on how they do. Um, you may still try the other one and see how they do clinically. There's a lot of work being done developing biomarkers to understand whether ARV7 is present and does that help select the population. And there was some interesting data presented this year at ASCO, so we'll see how that evolves over time. So as we move on to patients who have more moderate or substantial symptoms with, with their prostate cancer, then there's less data showing that enzalutamide and abiraterone are as effective. Again, these patients, these trials enrolled kind of more moderate pa uh, symptom patients, and we don't have as good data suggesting that they can really improve pain in um, patients with extreme pain or a lot of symptoms. Um, also, from a dose of taxol standpoint, if the cancer is moving very quickly, you may uh, you may find that to be a better therapy in the short term to kind of to slow things down. The other thing that doesn't really come into play with a a, um, a tumor burden standpoint, but if you have a patient, and I, I haven't really talked about it in this context, but the frontline therapy for uh, prostate cancer that's no longer curable is androgen suppression alone. So that's again chemical or surgical castration. If patients progressed on that very quickly, say within six months or a year, you may have concern that already in those patients that the angina receptor pathway is less relevant. And in those patients, then you may want to look at moving right to chemotherapy. So th again, it's not a flow chart, but you have to kind of look at not just the patient in front of you, but their treatment history and their response history and their comorbidities. So dose taxol I mentioned was actually FDA approved um, back in 2004, and it still may be a very good therapy for patients with pa fast-moving disease. So for people who say we shouldn't cut down the rainforest, docetaxel is one of the reasons why, because it comes from a tree in the Pacific Northwest, although I know there's no, uh, at least, uh, wet rainforest in the Pacific Northwest. But um, it, you know, this led to the development of an agent called paclitaxel, and so docetaxel is a synthetic kind of second-generation taxane that inhibits uh, microtubules. Um, so for years, it was thought that microtubules were necessary for cellular proliferation, and by blocking those, and, and, and uh, you basically can limit cellular proliferation in that manner. Some researchers actually have suggested that it's, it, it really is all about the androgen receptor in prostate cancer, and that basically the microtubules are necessary to, to transport the androgen receptor or its constituent pathway components from the cellular membrane activation to the nucleus, and that inhibiting microtubules, actually, you're inhibiting uh, the androgen receptor pathway. So I think that's just kind of interesting to remind us that how important the androgen receptor really is in, in, uh, in prostate cancer. So this was a study done in a previous era, before abiraterone and enzalutamide. Remember, this is 2000, probably, probably developed in the early 2000s. And um, they were looking at three schedules. At this time, there was nothing in prostate cancer that could extend survival in men with metastatic disease, uh, you know, beyond really castration. Um, that was the only thing. So, a couple of things here. They looked at docetaxel two schedules, either every three weeks or a lower dose at weekly, and then they looked at it in comparison, not to a placebo, but to mitoxantrin and prednisone. So, why mitoxantrin? And I haven't mentioned it yet. It was approved by the FDA in the 90s for palliation. It it didn't necessarily extend survival, but it did improve symptoms. So this was something that was being used in the clinic at that time. So why prednisone? Well, I mentioned abiraterone gets combined with prednisone because it mitigates uh, um, some of the toxicities, and that may be the case here, but realistically, the prednisone was included here as an artifact of clinical trial design, sort of. So when mitoxantrin was tested in the 90s, its comparator arm was prednisone. They didn't use a placebo. So they said, well, let's just include prednisone with the mitoxantrin regimen to make things even, and then you have only one variable, and, and that basically led to that regimen being developed. 
So when they did this study, they said, let's keep, keep everything equal and then add prednisone as well. So that's why the prednisone is included. It is a, kind of a relevant thing if you have patients who are having toxicity from the prednisone. Yes, we have a question. Okay, so prednisone, the question is, what is prednisone? It's a steroid. So it's a, a glucocorticoid or a steroid, and it, it has a, a role potentially in prostate cancer, of, at least in a palliative way, it could be anti-inflammatory. There's some hints that it may have anti-tumor effects as well. You'll see that in placebo arms of studies, but it's kind of, it's a steroid. Okay, good question. So these are the results of the study, and you see here that docetaxel every three weeks, remember, nothing had demonstrated a survival advantage at that point. Um, patients with metastatic disease probably lived about 10 or 12 months, and that was about it. And in this study, the, the Q3 weekly was superior to the other two arms, um, and, and patients uh, lived uh, for about 19 months. So I can't tell you how many times people come into my office or our clinic and says, I'm not going to get chemotherapy because I don't, I'm not going to take chemotherapy and all the side effects that go with it uh, for only two or three months of survival. I'll show you a long list of side effects, but of all the chemotherapies out there, docetaxel actually is pretty well tolerated, and I've treated men in their 90s with it, and they actually can do pretty well. Most, most of the patients actually still go to work on this regimen. But what they what unfortunately doesn't come across in this data, and this gets perpetuated, unfortunately, too often, even though it's older data, that chemo doesn't really do anything meaningful. What it misses is that there was a crossover here. So patients who progressed on mitoxantrone could have gone on to get docetaxel as part of the study. So anytime you have a built-in crossover within a study, you're underestimating the treatment effect. And so the reality is it was quite surprising that the mitoxantrone patients lived 16 and a half months. It was kind of historical data suggested they'd probably live closer to 10 months. So usually with that information, the patients are a little more open-minded. But it is very important how you interpret these studies and these deltas, if you will. Um, always kind of look out for either functional built-in crossovers like this, or the, like the one I mentioned earlier with enzalutamide, which is just a kind of, may have been a more real-world crossover. So again, long list of toxicities, and that's certainly the case. Um, um, the most profound side effects are really neutropenia, which could lead to neutropenic infection, which can lead to death. So you just have to have some education of the patients that, you know, if they get febrile, we need to kind of explore the, their do a workup. Most times they're not infected, but if they are, they could, they could be lethal. So we want to bring them in, get them antibiotics, and get some blood cultures done. Neuropathy could be irreversible and also life-changing, and that's something to be aware of as well. But I think that a lot of these side effects are reversible. And in this initial study, patients only got 10 cycles of docetaxel. Uh, to this day, some people only still give 10 cycles. Our practice here, and other people have done this as well, is to kind of continue it and in, in, until basically there's disease progression in metastatic castration resistant disease I'm talking about now. But you continue the dose tax until there's, until basically it stops working. The way to kind of get patients through this is to give them breaks from the chemotherapy because a lot of these uh, side effects can reverse themselves. So dating back to when we didn't have abiraterone and zalutamide, I could tell you we had some patients who had treatment with dose taxol for up to five or six years on and off. So it can be done for that long. And these were men in their 70s and 80s. So they did have side effects, but we were able to get them through it because giving them holidays, things could, or chemotherapy holidays or breaks, their side effects could resolve. So I do think, again, that in patients with fast-moving disease, that chemotherapy is still maybe even the frontline agent despite these newer options. Radium-223 represents an alternative option for patients who are symptomatic. Uh, the clinical trials did not evaluate patients with large visceral disease, and so you know most people will avoid it in that. You'll see based on its mechanism of action, there's not really a rationale for why it would work in patients with visceral disease, but it's really for patients with symptomatic bone disease. I didn't get into that just for from a natural history standpoint, but it is worth noting 90% of men with prostate cancer have disease in their bones, and most men have disease only in their bones, okay? So it is a bone-dominant disease, Visceral disease alone is, is, like I said, about 10%. And patients with lymph node disease alone is rare, but those patients actually do the best. So um, it's just something worth uh, understanding when we're talking about why a radiopharmaceutical that localizes to the bones and provides palliation and survival advantage is so valuable. So I'm not a physicist, but I will kind of try to pretend to play one for the next couple of slides as I tell you what radium-223 is. It is a alpha par alpha particle emitting agent that basically uh, binds to high areas 
uh, of activity within the bones, such as areas with growing prostate cancer. And the, the, the like I said, the radium-223 emits alpha particles. This is relevant because older bio, uh, I'm sorry, radiopharmaceuticals were beta-emitting uh, agents, such as strontium and samarium, both of which were approved for patients with bone-based cancers, but only for palliation. Because those agents were beta-emitting, the destruction radius of those lighter beta particles within the bone was larger. So you had a greater impact on innocent bystander cells like red blood cells and platelets, and so you got into toxicity issues real quick. With alpha particles, yes, you can still have drops and counts, but because the destruction radius is smaller, it's not as much of a treatment-limiting effect. Of course, if you have patients with a ton of bone disease, you're going to have a lot of alpha particles in the bones, and that, that could be an issue. But certainly, it was better tolerated than the older agent. So again, in some ways, you see how this is a, a rational update of an older strategy. So they did this trial again around the time when docetaxel was the only improved agent, um, where they randomized patients to this agent or placebo. Uh, it's come out since that basically the number of infusions and the dose that they used was actually pretty arbitrary. Um, they pretty much locked people in a hotel room until they agreed on something, and this is what they came out with. So there's still some discussion about whether this is the optimum dose, but it worked. In the phase three trial, patients lived longer um, if they had received chemo, I'm sorry, radium-223 versus placebo. And this was regardless of chemotherapy. Um, so, and, and there was, uh, you see here that the subgroup analysis, uh, the overall survival benefit occurred regardless of whether patients had had previous chemotherapy or not. So it's worth noting that you don't necessarily need chemotherapy to benefit from this agent. The palliative benefits were a little less clear in patients who were more advanced and had had chemotherapy, but there was evidence in patients with earlier, I guess, uh, stage disease where the, the, the radium-223 improved symptoms. So this was an important update because previously radiopharmaceuticals, as I said, were palliative. Now we have something with a survival advantage. And we're still trying to probably figure out the exact niche of this agent. Um, the, the primary side effects that we see with it are hematologic, as I said, but they're not as profound and treatment limiting as what we saw with older versions of this. Uh, recently, there has been some uh, data that came out that said when you combine radium-223 with abiraterone, you have increased fractures. No one really understands this yet. I know the company's been looking at this for a little while. Um, they alerted uh, everybody about a year ago. Um, there's other data that didn't raise that concern, but it's just something to be aware of but, uh, with radium-223. But on its own, you know, it's, I think it's still evidence that there's a, a viable treatment opportunity for patients. So as we move on to our third course of therapy here, um, these are patients who have already progressed on docetaxel. So remember, I've already shown you data from enzalutamide, abiraterone, and radium-223 uh, that they all work after docetaxel. So if patients had docetaxel and had, had not had those agents, they can get it in their third course. Cabazitaxel is specifically uh, for patients who had progressed on docetaxel. So what is cabazitaxel? Well, it's a taxane that dif differs only by two hydroxyl groups than docetaxel. So people were like, all right, well, they developed this. They said, let's do a phase three in patients who had, had docetaxel. I don't think there was a lot of expectations that this would work. This is another agent you know, that kind of an update of a, a different version. And what they did in this trial was they took patients who had already progressed on docetaxel. Again, mitoxantrin was a palliative agent that's even used to this day, but was used at that time more often in patients who had already progressed on docetaxel. And they did a, a randomized study here. And what they found here was that um, there was an improvement in progression-free survival, as you see the two curves split, and overall survival. So and I think this came out in 2011. See this. This was uh, before abiraterone and enzalutamide demonstrated survival advantage, and uh, cabazitaxel actually did. Now there was concern because there was some uh, treatment-related uh, uh, infections or neutropenic infections in about five percent of the patients that led to death. So I think there have been issues and, and some pause for people using this. I mentioned the dose was 25 in the phase three study, so it's worth noting that. Growth factor wasn't mandated and probably underutilized in that study and maybe could have limited some of those neutropenic infections. Um, but people had commonly been reducing the dose to 20 milligrams, just I think without data. So actually the company that makes docetaxel also makes cabazitaxel. So they ran a head-to-head -head trial uh, that was reported out in 2016 in a frontline setting. 
So metastatic castration resistant disease to see if cabazitaxel was better. It, it was no real clear evidence that it was. So um, it didn't supplant docetaxel as kind of our frontline metastatic uh, chemo agent. But what it did show was that the 25 milligram dose and the 20 milligram dose were a little, are equivalent. So you could probably get away with a little bit of a lower dose and uh, not have to worry about as much myelosuppression. So I think cabazitaxel still struggles to be used because patients are, uh, are, are providers are reluctant Patients are reluctant to get a second chemo, but I, I think it can be an option, again, in, in certain patient populations. So again, I'd already mentioned that these agents all have survival data um, after um, chemotherapy, and it's worth, it's worth noting that. So, you know, I think it looks like we've got a lot of therapies, but when you start breaking it down that, you know, you're only giving this one for a month, and I'm telling you probably you want to just move on to your next therapy, you probably can only use one of these. You know, both of these may be possible, but the palliative benefits, you know, I think both of these are possible. But you quickly see how if you just jump from one to another, you actually start running out of therapies. Um, for, and these, that, that has implications for, uh, you know, your patient's lifespan. So I think you want to be thoughtful in how you deploy these therapies. And again, this is where I think taking account what treatment failure is, which is radiographic progression and not just the rise in PSA, you don't want to kind of come off these therapies willy-nilly and waste these opportunities for patients. So the ultimate goal from my perspective when I talk to patients is how can we kind of line all these therapies up so you can benefit from as many of them as possible, maximize your quality, your length of life, but also your quality of life. And so, again, it's not a flow chart, but hopefully, um, you know, kind of I presented a rational way to look at this. Other people will have their rational ways as well, but I think it just gets you started down the path to understand how we deal with this disease in the clinic. So the special on our menu is the same special as we had last year because it still has breakthrough status, and that's PARP inhibition. So um, I mentioned it has breakthrough status with the FDA. I mentioned that about 30% of men have um, evidence of DNA damage repair mutations, which can be targeted by PARP inhibitors. Um, and this was demonstrated in a clinical trial by Dr. Uh, Johan de Bono and his group over in England. And what they demonstrated um, uh, Sorry, going the wrong direction. Okay, I'm sorry. I I, uh, I missed a couple slides in here, so you'll excuse me. But what they were able to demonstrate was that patients who had this mutation benefited greatly from PARP inhibition, and essentially this led to breakthrough status. There's there's multiple phase three trials going on with this, these type of agents at this time. And there's a high likelihood that maybe when I give this talk next year or shortly thereafter, we'll have phase three data for this. So um, I had already shown this. I'm just going to skip ahead here to newer data that's out. So I'd mentioned I've been talking about castration resistant prostate cancer until now. So again, that's patients who were treated with hormone suppression when they get metastatic disease are already castrated. Now we're talking about how do we treat people who have metastatic disease that's castration sensitive? So who are these patients? These are patients who either walk into their doctor's office, have a normal testosterone, didn't know they have prostate cancer, and unfortunately have it spread throughout their body. So it's a different population. Does that kind of make sense? Remember, if you, have, you, you haven't been treated for your prostate cancer, the other patient group is patients who may have been treated three or four years ago and are not on any therapy, and the hope was that they were cured, but they come in, their PSA is higher, they have symptoms or they don't, but they look and they have metastatic disease and normal testosterone. Every other tri trial and therapy I've talked about has been in patients with castrate levels of testosterone, which means they've gone through frontline castration. So in this uh, population, um, there was a study that was done shortly after docetaxel that was, a, was approved, looking at combining the standard, which would have been hormone suppression, with the docetaxel regimen that I just described every three weeks that was developed for castration-resistant disease. And this data came out in 2015 um, that was published at least then. I think we had some inkling of it a year or two before. But you see there's a profound effect over a long timeline. So these patients are going to live about four to five years with metastatic disease and all the therapies that are available. But you see that if they got just six infusions of chemotherapy up front, they had a 13-month improvement in their median survival. So this then became a standard of care for this population uh, beyond just, just hormone suppression alone. 
So this is evidence now that if we move a treatment in later castration resistant disease earlier to castration sensitive disease, that it works better. And so I think we're starting to see that with a lot of these therapies. Um, there are some aspects of this that's worth understanding without getting into too much details. They divided the group into high volume and low volume. Here are the definitions. They're relatively arbitrary. Um, there's some suggestion that the low volume patients did very well on their own with just androgen suppression and may not require chemotherapy. I, I, I would be a little cautious in over-interpreting that. Um, I think some of these volume markers are kind of imperfectly applied, and that's probably a broader discussion when there's more time, but, and, and lymph node doesn't really factor in. Um, personally, I think dose taxes still may be relevant for patients with metastatic castration sensitive disease. Here's a breakdown of some of the, the low volume patients. I think it's worth noting two things. One is this is a much smaller group. You see, this is only a couple hundred patients. So I'm not sure we had the, the power to do this, to look at this comparison. Um, but also, there's some other nuances here that at least I have some questions about. So I think this is part of your discussion with your patients, especially if they have low-volume disease, on whether or not they would get chemotherapy in their newly diagnosed metastatic status. The tolerability of six infusions of chemotherapy was actually very good because it's very limited in the number of therapies, six infusions over 18 weeks. Came out to roughly 85 or 87 percent of patients who started the therapy finished. So I think that speaks to its tolerability. And uh, again, why I'm comfortable offering it to a lot of our patients. Abiraterone, I'd mentioned that, that's the CYP17 inhibitor, has also been tested in this population. Uh, and we had data from that last year at ASCO from two trials. I'll share with you one of them. This is patients with high risk metastatic disease, again, castration sensitive. So we're talking about castration sensitive disease, very similar to the last study, although their definition of who could come on was a little different. High risk was basically anyone with a high Gleason score, which is a pathology score, more than three sites of disease or any visceral disease. So again, very arbitrary, but the benefits were clear. And that is that if you got abiraterone as compared to placebo, which is androgen suppression alone, uh, you did better. So this is not, it's worth noting it's ADT or androgen suppression with placebo. So it's not just a straight placebo arm. So there was a clear survival advantage. The difference here though, that's worth noting also is that you're on abiraterone until you progress. Whereas you got the six infusion of the chemotherapy in that other study and you were done. And I think that influences too some people's decisions on, on which of these therapies to use. It, it does mine to some degree. Generally, it was well tolerated, but if you're on these therapies for two or three years, you can see how there can be eventually patients with grade three or four uh, adverse events, some cardiac issues, some uh, liver function issues since it's metabolized by the liver, but generally pretty well tolerated. Um, it is worth noting this though, and this is I think is an open question for both these studies. This was not a study of abiraterone early versus abiraterone late. So in other words, I'm saying patients got it at newly diagnosed castration sensitive disease. Does that, the, the default assumption if you just think about it is like, well, you just give it as early as you can and it's gonna work better. That's not what this study was able to evaluate. This study was done before abiraterone was largely available and approved. So you see if you break it down, only 25% of the patients or so, I guess it was 27, in this study with abiraterone, so that's the study here, in this study, who got, only 27% of these placebo patients went on to get abiraterone or enzalutamide. So remember I talked about the crossover effect here? So there's really not, you know, it's not like everybody got it when they were metastatic. So there's not much of a crossover effect here. And so therefore I'd be very cautious to say that we should just give it earlier to everybody and this proves that it works earlier. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing some nods here, so that's good. So I think we just have to be cautious in how we interpret that. I, feel, I still think it's an open question of whether or not you, you benefit more at that point or to get it later. And I think that also factors in on whether you choose docetaxel or abiraterone. So <clears throat> there's no head-to-head -head data um, in which of these is better, uh, there is some indirect evidence from England that they might be equivalent from some studies done there. Um, you definitely need ADT with both options, that's worth noting. Um, I, I, I discuss this with patients. My bias for various reasons is to use docetaxel, mainly because you get your six infusions and you're done uh, for at least a little while, uh, whereas the abiraterone, you're kind of on that every day until you, it, it stops working. And um, I think also you probably can come back to the docetaxel later on down the road if you progress a year afterwards or even six months afterwards. 
But actually, that's an open research question. We don't really know how getting the docetaxel up front or even the abiraterone changes this. So these are just some questions that are unanswered, and again, part of there are discussions with the patients. So in the last couple minutes, I'll share with you the newest data in what we call M0 prostate cancer. So shifting now back to castration-resistant cancer, unlike the first two groups that I talked about, these patients are not metastatic on conventional imaging. So these are patients who have a rising PSA, they're castrate, but no evidence of disease on scans, okay? So that, uh, is the distinction clear? So castration-resistant metastatic disease means castrate levels of testosterone, rising PSA, progression. Castration-sensitive means your testosterone is normal. In these patients, their testosterone is suppressed, but their PSA is rising, suggesting that their cancer is moving. So these patients may have five to, you know, 10 years, well, probably not 10, but five years or more to live based on some literature. And previously, we had used various strategies on how to treat these patients. There were two phase three trials that were presented earlier this year that demonstrated that agents compared to placebo uh, demonstrated an overall survival advantage. Again, in, in these patients previously, some people used older versions of, of the agents I've talked to you about, older androgen receptor antagonists or CYP17 inhibitors. So apalutamide is a kind of newer version of enzalutamide. I won't get into a lot of details. I think you understood what enzalutamide was, um, and it was developed by, by the same creators. So here's the study they did, again, in this M0 population. Again, there was no FDA-approved therapy, so in addition to ADT, they just got a placebo. And what they were able to get an agreement on from the FDA, which is actually a big deal, for the first time, the FDA agreed to something that wasn't survival in a prostate cancer study. They agreed to metastasis-free survival, or MFS. And what they were able to demonstrate uh, in this population that it's worth noting who these patients are. They're seven or eight years removed from their initial diagnosis, and they're much older. So men in a lot of the MCRPC, or metastatic castration-resistant disease studies, are often in their 60s. These gentlemen in their 70s, and that's pretty typical of the population. So you want to factor in their longevity when you talk about these agents and their use. And patients have gotten older versions of these agents about three quarters of the time. So here's the evidence that apalutamide improved metastasis-free survival, which was the primary endpoint of this study, and um, basically led to FDA approval based on this. They also evaluated patients and gave them abiraterone after this. Okay, so they said, well, you know, do they still do okay with abiraterone afterwards? The survival, or the progression-free survival curves based on previous therapy with placebo or ap apalutamide suggested that you know, you do, again, you're not seeing a crossover effect where these curves are coming together. I still think there's probably overlapping mechanisms of resistance between apalutamide, which is very similar to enzalutamide and abiraterone, but this is encouraging data, although probably not uh, perfect, but it would certainly be worth uh, following for a little bit longer. But apalutamide was approved for this non-metastatic castration-sensitive setting. There was some toxicity to be aware of, you see there's increased risk of falls, fractures, and fatigue. Again, when you're talking about an older population, you have to look at them and understand, you know, is this guy going to live long enough to benefit from this treatment with all these side effects with their other comorbidities? So the enzalutamide folks said, hey, we could do a similar study, and I think that's, I don't know for sure, but they, they certainly did. Um, again, very similar population, this M0 group. It's worth noting the eligibility just for, for using these patients. PSA is greater than uh, 2 in doubling time of 10 months. but very similar um, population, again, median age is 74. And um, there were, again, side effects that were seen and, uh, in, in this study that are they're worth noting. But they also got the same agreement from the FDA to have metastasis-free survival as an endpoint. And again, not surprisingly, this, these agents are really good. So it's not surprisingly, compared to placebo, they did very well. You see these huge hazard ratios. And this also has been kind of added to the label for enzalutamide. So now these agents can be used earlier. They're following this, these patients long term. And again, we don't know whether getting these, these treatments earlier are really beneficial. So I think the overall survival analysis will be interesting long term. So it is worth noting, it's kind of a weird thing, that there was a higher death rate within basically three months or four months of completing the study. Um, some of that may come from the fact that if you're progressing over three years as opposed to one year. If you follow patients longer, you can have more adverse events or deaths, unfortunately, in an older population. But I think this is an open question that's worth following. And again, just got to pay attention to your patients. 
So I'll just skip over this, um, my thoughts, because I think you've been hearing my thoughts for an hour now. But just to give you a hint of where the field is going, you know, we're still, as, you, as I've said a number of times, don't know the best sequence of therapy, uh, and we don't have the best biomarkers yet, so we're still trying to identify that and whether combinations are better than individual therapies. Imaging, I, won't, I didn't get into that at all, but imaging is becoming more sensitive with some new pet technologies, uh, and that will change how we see prostate cancer, and so we'll diagnose it perhaps metastatic earlier, and that will change perhaps some of our strategies. There's a very large emphasis in detecting oligometastatic disease, which is patients with a few lesions, either on PET imaging or standard imaging, and try to go after a cure in those patients. Um, I think right now it's still an open question. Uh, I, I went through a lot of this talk and didn't talk about the hottest field in oncology right now, which is immunotherapy. The, the data I talked about was from like 10 years ago. That's part of what I do here, along with my colleagues in the field here and elsewhere. We're trying to develop a role for immunotherapy in prostate cancer. Why that's been a tough nut to crack beyond sipilucil T is kind of a whole lecture in of itself. So uh, maybe that's for another day. But I thank you everyone for your attention. I know that there's another lecture coming here, so I will make way. I'll cede the floor. If anyone has any questions, I'll just step outside for a sec. Thank you. I guess we have time for a question, so go ahead. Okay, so the question was, are there any biomarker tests or genetic tests we can use? So I think that's where the DNA damage repair mutations are coming into, into um, play. And so now that we know that a third of prostate cancer patients have uh, uh, DNA damage repair mutations and 12, 12 to 15 percent have germline mutations, that is going to be an indicator for therapy. And I would test for that probably in the metastatic setting. Those patients seem to still do okay on abiraterone or enzalutamide. But when patients are starting to progress on that, it's probably worth doing genetic testing at that time. Some other molecular biomarkers, I mentioned people are looking for circulator, circulating markers of ARV7, uh, things like that. There are a lot of other things being explored. Circulating tumor cells have also been another circulating biomarker that have been of interest and are, um, have been companion, in, developed in companion with some of these therapies. Right, so just in that trial, the distinction was basically four lesions. We're talking about docetaxel and metastatic castration sensitive disease. Um, it was basically four lesions, um, at least one of which had to be outside the pelvis or spine. But it's a very arbitrary decision that they made. And I think that you can, you can see where a patient would have a ton of disease in the spine, and somehow it would still count as low volume because they didn't have anything outside the spine. So it's arbitrary decisions, but it's worth discussing just in that context of that data. Okay, thank you. The TRACO next week will be on Monday. And uh, I sent emails about the core facilities so you can visit uh, the genomics core, the pathology core, or the small molecule core. And then you can visit tumor boards, the uh, urologic oncology branch, and the medical oncology branch. So if you're interested, you have to fill out the sheet and return it to me by the end of the month. And then in October, we'll start doing the core visits. So our next speaker, Ha Bin Chen, he got his MD degree from Shanghai Medical University. He then came to the US and got a PhD from New York University. He was a research assistant professor at New York University for several years and completed an internal medicine residency in Brooklyn. He came to NCI in 2013, and he's an assistant clinical investigator in the thoracic and oncolog oncologic surgery branch, and he's investigating novel epigenetic therapies for small cell lung cancer. So the title of his talk is Small Cell Lung Cancer. How about <laughs> All right. All right. Hello everyone. So it's a glad, you know, I'm very happy to come back here to talk about a small cell lung cancer again. Um, Terry, thank you so much for the nice introduction. All right.
So this is the outline of my today's talk. So I will first uh, give you an introduction about small cell lung cancer and tell you how we treat a small cell lung cancer uh, in clinic. And also we'll talk about uh, what kind of challenges we have uh, for uh, the small cell lung cancer. And then I will talk about uh, some unique genomic features of the small cell lung cancer. And also we'll give you two examples about uh, the drug development uh, for the small cell lung cancer. And finally, I will also touch a little bit about the extrapulmonary small cell carcinoma. All right, let's dive in. So, the, so what is a small cell lung cancer? Actually, the small cell lung cancer got its name because uh, the morphology of the cells look uh, you know, pretty small compared to the other cancer cells uh, in the lung. So you know, just to give you a feeling how small the small cell lung cancer cells are. So actually, I have a HA standing of the small cell uh, tumor specimen here. So what are the uh, the arrows point out is uh, the the cells of a small cell lung cancer, and uh, the what are the arrowhead point out is uh, the uh, lymphocytes in the blood vessel. You can see that uh, the small cell lung cancer cells are just a little bit bigger than the lymphocytes in the blood vessel, and then. When you compare it to the stroma cells in this tumor, you can see that uh, the tumor cells is much smaller. So that's how the small cell lung cancer uh, got its name. Um, certainly, you know, we cannot just uh, you know, make a diagnosis of a small cell lung cancer just based on its, uh, its tumor size. And so when pathology sees these, and uh, so they will actually do the immunohistochemical scanning. So it's known that a small cell lung cancer uh, has a neuroendocrine feature. So usually it expresses some of the neuroendocrine markers. So such as uh, uh, chromogranin A and also synaptophysin. So the pathologist uh, you know, can stand for those markers and if it's positive, so it will support the diagnosis of the small cell uh, lung cancer. And small cell lung cancer is a one subtype of uh, lung cancer. So conventionally, uh, lung cancer is actually divided into two, uh, uh, two groups. One is a small cell lung cancer, and the other group is a non-small cell lung cancer. And non-small cell lung cancer actually include uh, several histology types, such as uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and also large cell uh, carcinoma. So you may wonder why you know, we make uh, such a kind of uh, the uh, nomenclature as a small cell lung cancer and a non-small cell lung cancer. And that's because the small cell lung cancer has a, a very different uh, the, uh, clinical course compared to the non-small cell lung cancer. So what's different is that a small cell lung cancer is much more aggressive and also patients uh, often develop a metastasis very early. So the, the survival of the patients with a, non -small cell, uh, with a small cell lung cancer is much shorter than the patients with a non-small cell lung cancer. So that's why you know, it's uh, to have uh, this uh, uh, different uh, the nomenclature. And the, uh, because the small cell lung cancer is very aggressive and the metastasis very early, and surgery actually do not play a major role in the treatment of the small cell lung cancer. So in contrast, surgery is uh, you know, the major treatment uh, modality for non-metastatic, non-small cell lung cancer. So um, besides that, a small cell lung cancer also you know, is very unique that uh, it's, it's associated with uh, uh, the endocrinopathy. So the small cell lung cancer is able, you know, to excrete some of uh, the uh, neuroendocrine uh, transmitter, such as uh, ACTH. So it can lead to the overproduction of uh, corticosteroids in the, uh, in the adrenal glands, and that can lead to uh, Cushing syndrome. So another uh, syndrome that's associated with a small cell lung cancer is called the lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. So in this syndrome, a uh, patient actually has a production of antibody that can target the presynaptic calcium channel. So patient actually has a difficulty of uh, uh, the, uh, emitting the uh, acetylcholine from the presynaptic membrane. So patient usually start with uh, uh, the 
uh, inability to move the, the extremity and but you know over exercise patient actually you know can move better so that's uh, because uh, over time then over exercise and uh, the capability of uh, the acetylcholine release is actually improved so the small cell lung cancer is actually a very difficult cancer to treat and in 2014 NCI designated uh, small cell lung cancer as uh, one of the two uh, recalcitrant cancers. So the other recalcitrant cancer is a pancreatic cancer. Uh, so re the reason to, uh, to uh, have a small cell lung cancer designated as a recalcitrant cancer is because uh, the five-year survival rate of the small cell lung cancer is pretty low, and it is only about 7%. Meantime, uh, every year in the U.S., there's about a 30,000 deaths due to the small cell lung cancer. So it also has a quite a huge impact uh, in, you know, on the, the, on the uh, American's health. So that's why uh, it's, it's uh, uh, designated as a, a recalcitrant cancer. Uh, actually, NCI identified four major obstacles to progress in 2014. So the, the first uh, obstacle is that uh, the patient, uh, actually the smokers, are at uh, the continuous risk of uh, developing the small cell lung cancer even decades after uh, smoking cessation. So it makes it uh, you know, quite difficult to uh, follow those uh, high-risk uh, subjects. And because uh, you know, even 10 years or 20 years after smoking cessation, this may still develop a small cell lung cancer. And second, uh, the obstacle we mentioned about that uh, and most patients actually uh, have a metastatic disease at the time of the diagnosis. And the third obstacle is that uh, although the small cell lung cancer is pretty sensitive to the radiation and also chemotherapy, however, they develop a resistance very quickly. So that uh, you know, when patients uh, develop a resistance, then there are not too many uh, treatment options for them. And the fourth obstacle is that uh, because uh, small cell lung cancer is not a, a disease that can be treated with surgery. So we actually don't have uh, too many uh, specimens you know, for research. And so uh, actually since uh, 2014, so there has been a lot of collaboration in the scientific community over sharing the data. So uh, this uh, actually issue is uh, getting uh, gradually resolved. So if uh, you are a researcher who is interested in studying about small cell lung cancer, then you wanna kind of try to tackle all these uh, obstacles. For example, you know, uh, for the patient who continue to be at a risk of developing small cell lung cancer, you wanna identify you know, uh, uh, some markers that can make an early diagnosis of the small cell lung cancer or predict the risk. And for the patient who, uh, for the, you know, to address uh, the question of uh, the uh, resistance to the therapy, then you, you wanna develop a, you know, a novel therapy or the combinatory therapy so that can uh, delay the development of the resistance. So the staging of the small cell lung cancer is relatively simple. So we only have a, you know, two stages of small cell lung cancer. The first stage is a limited disease and the second one is extensive disease. And the distinction between these two is quite simple. So if all the disease that you can detect on the imaging can be incorporated into one radiation port, then we call it a limited stage. Then the patient can be treated with uh, both uh, the radiation and also systemic chemotherapy. And if a patient has uh, extensive disease, meaning that a patient has a pretty widespread disease, you cannot uh, cover all the disease with one radiation port. So in that case, uh, patient can only be treated with uh, chemotherapy. And apparently, you know, patient has more advanced disease and the prognosis is also worse in the patient with ext extensive disease. So in average, the uh, survival of the patients with a small cell lung cancer after diagnosis is around a, a year. So 
how do we treat a small cell lung cancer? As I mentioned, that uh, the systemic chemotherapy uh, is a uh, uh, is uh, the main treatment modality for this disease. It actually was learned quite early in 1970s that uh, the single agent is not as effective as a combinatory uh, treatment. So there actually has been research of testing the two drug combination versus three drug combination. And it was found that three drug combination was more effective. However, there was also more toxicity. So if you balance this out, it still seems like uh, the two drug combination is uh, more effective. And so over the past 30-ish years, the, the platinum plus the etopside, uh, the uh, drug combination is uh, still the pro uh, first line therapy. So, so far we haven't identified a more effective uh, first line therapy uh, this is not because of uh, lack of trying. It's just because, uh, in, you know, uh, we found that uh, the addition of a third agent is either not uh, effective or it's just, uh, you know, a bit too toxic. So to to really to justify the benefit it, it can bring. And the second line therapy for the patient who has progressed after uh, the first line chemotherapy is a, a topotecan. Topotecan is an uh, uh, inhibitor of uh, tomo, uh, topoisomerase 1. Uh, in Japan, so they also uh, found that uh, the other drug in the same class, irinotecan, is effective in, uh, in the second line setting. However, in the US, uh, topotecan is the only one that's uh, approved by the FDA. And just very recently, uh, a new checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, has just been approved uh, by uh, FDA uh, to treat a patient who has progressed after first line of chemotherapy plus uh, another line of therapy. So this is in the third line setting that a patient uh, can be treated with uh, uh, immune therapy, uh, in this case, immune checkpoint inhibitor. All right, so as I mentioned earlier that a small cell lung cancer tends to metastasize very easily. So when patient you know, treated, was treated with uh, the systemic chemotherapy and after certain uh, months, then patient had a recurrence of disease. At that time, uh, patient often develop uh, the metastasis in the brain. And this is not surprising because uh, the brain is a, a sanctuary site, meaning that uh, the chemo drug is, a, you know, uh, does not penetrate uh, through the blood brain barrier very well. So in the brain, you have a very low chemo drug concentration. So that's the reason why if there is a metastasis in the brain, the systemic chemo may not be able to touch the cancer cells in the brain. So uh, in actually in the 1980s, so there have been some attempts to treat patients who uh, had a good response to the systemic chemo with uh, the uh, radiation therapy uh, over the brain. So the idea is that uh, you know if we can give the radiation to also to kill the the tumor cells in the brain, maybe those patients you know won't come will have a recurrence with the brain metastasis that easily. So the in the 1990s, uh, actually uh, meta analysis showed that uh, the prophylactic cranial irradiation, which is stands for it, which actually means uh, the uh, prophylactic. Uh, brain irradiation actually helped to improve uh, the survival of the patient uh, who had a complete response from the initial chemotherapy. And then a phase try uh, was initiated. So in this try, so they actually select a patient who had a, a response from the systemic chemo. But at that time, it was not a popular to do the brain imaging. So, uh, so the patient who were enrolled on the trial was unknown to have a, a brain mass or not. And so over the um, several years, so the result came out and showing that uh, the prophylactic uh, cranial irradiation actually helped to decrease uh, the occurrence of uh, brain metastasis, but meantime also uh, helped to improve the progression-free survival and also overall survival in the patients uh, who had a response to the initial chemotherapy. So the data actually was shown on the right side, and you can see that uh, the, the, 
the survival curve of the patient who received the prophylactic uh, cranial irradiation uh, does uh, much better than the patient who did not uh, receive uh, the, the PCI uh, initially. However, there's a catch here that, uh, you know, as I mentioned that uh, the patient who were enrolled on this try did not have a brain imaging before irradiation. But now we know, you know, we actually, the, the imaging is very common. So how about the patient who uh, was not found to have a brain metastasis, whether those patients should receive the irradiation or not? The reason to ask that question is that uh, the brain irradiation is not something that benign because uh, and, you know, patient actually after irradiation can feel very fatigued and over a long time, patient also can develop uh, memory issues. So, you know, could not find the right words and so on. So it's actually affected patient's uh, cognitive, uh, you know, capability. So if uh, it's not, uh, you know, necessary, so can we really try to avoid this uh, therapy, in, you know? So to address that question, actually, uh, this is a Japanese group that did uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, clinical try to select the patients who had uh, the magnetic resonance imaging of the brain and who were not found to have a brain metastasis and then randomize them into the uh, prophylactic cranial irradiation uh, versus uh, no uh, irradiation. So actually, they actually found uh, quite a different results. So, so up here, it shows the uh, overall survival of the patient. The right curve represents the patient who received the prophylactic cranial irradiation. Actually, you can see that uh, the patient who received the irradiation actually did a little bit worse than the patient who did not receive the irradiation. Although the difference is not uh, statistically significant, but at least uh, there's no clear benefit. And in the lower part, it shows that uh, the patient who uh, received the irradiation does have a less chance to develop a brain metastasis compared to the patient who uh, do not receive uh, irradiation. But this is just point out that, uh, and, and so, you know, we actually are capable of uh, stratified patients based on the risk. And so that uh, it will be possible to provide a more precise therapy so that uh, you, you only select a patient who will benefit from the treatment and, and then give the treatment so that you avoid the unnecessary harm to the patient who may actually may not benefit from the treatment. All right, so now I'm going to uh, switch gear and talk about uh, the unique gen genetic features of the small cell lung cancer. So it actually was recognized very early that uh, small cell lung cancer has uh, the uh, you know, pretty significant uh, chromosomal abnormalities. So it was found that a small cell lung cancer uh, often has a deletion of uh, the chromosome 3P21. So what's shown here on the left side is uh, the, uh, the chromosome 3 over five, uh, the cell line established for, from five different patients with a small cell lung cancer. As you can see that, uh, you know, there's all, you know, there's some difference in the lens. So that you know, suggests uh, the deletion of the, the chromosome. So what's a common about uh, all these five, uh, the cell lines is that uh, they all have uh, the deletion of uh, chromosomal region 3P21. Um, so this is quite interesting. And in that, uh, the chromosome region, there's actually, uh, close to 100 genes. So to this data, we still haven't really figured out what gene is actually critical for the development of the small cell lung cancer uh, in that region. And could this be used to, uh, to uh, make a diagnosis of a small cell lung cancer? But the answer is no, because uh, this is uh, not uh, something that's very specific to the small cell lung cancer. And this, uh, the chromosomal abnormality could also be found in the patient with the other type of uh, lung cancer. And actually it could also be found in the, uh, the lung epithelium injured by the, you know, the, by the smoke, uh, uh, tobacco smoke. So uh, we cannot really use this to make the, uh, 
to make an early diagnosis of the small cell lung cancer. But this is just a, a very interesting uh, finding. So besides the chromosome 3P21 deletion, so there's other regions such as the chromosome 13Q and the chromosome 17P uh, deleted uh, in the small cell lung cancer. And so actually this is back in 1980s. Um, um, the, so that's actually uh, one of the NCI researchers, uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick Kay, uh, he actually had the idea that uh, uh, because uh, the RB gene, retinoblastoma gene, uh, is located in the chromosome 13Q, so he actually checked to see whether you know the RB gene is commonly deleted in the small cell lung cancer. So here was is the data of uh, the northern blot, which is a way to detect the expression of uh, of a gene. And now we always use uh, the quantitative RT-PCR to check the expression of the gene. So, but that's uh, back in 1980s. So what he found was that uh, compared to the uh, non-small cell lung cancer, as shown here, the small cell lung cancer often have uh, no signal of the RB. That suggests the deletion of uh, the RB. So this was also found in the uh, carcinoid which is also a type of uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumor, but it's relatively uh, low grade. And then he expanded his analysis and included more uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. And he found that a uh, you know, majority of the small cell lung cancer cell lines uh, have a loss of uh, RB. Um, during the meantime, John Minner, who, is also, uh, who was also in NCI at that time, and so ask a question whether P53 is affected. As we know that a P53 is located in the chromosome uh, 17P. And he actually did an analysis and found that a, a P53 was often uh, you know, uh, deleted or mutated uh, in the small cell lung cancer. So uh, you can see that some may have a point or small mutation, some may have a you know, deletion that leads to the abnormal size of uh, the uh, MRA. So here, there's also some small cell lung cancer cell line, which was thought not to have any uh, detectable uh, abnormality, but now uh, with a, a deeper uh, sequencing, and uh, these cell lines are often found to have uh, mutations in P53 uh, as well. So these studies establish a correlation between the mutation or deletion of RB and the P53 with the small cell lung cancer. But it doesn't establish the, uh, the causation relationship. So whether the deletion or mutation of RB and P53 can lead to the small cell lung cancer. So this is actually questions uh, answered uh, by using the transgenic animal models. Um, so uh, in this study, um, Dr. Uh, Anton Byrne and actually established transgenic MOS model with uh, the uh, conditioning uh, inactivation of uh, P53 and RB1 uh, in the lung in the lung of uh, the uh, of a mouse model. So over two months of period of time, uh, he actually was able to find there's some uh, hypoplastic focus in the airway, as you can see from here. And if you do the, the BRDU scanning, which actually helped to, uh, to uh, analyze uh, the proliferation, you can see that uh, uh, the cells in this region are highly uh, proliferated. So if you wait long enough, about uh, six, to, six months to one year, so this, uh, mice actually can develop uh, the small cell lung cancer. It's just, a, you know, the latent period is quite long. So later on, he actually added additional gene mutations, such as uh, he added the activated MYC, and actually the development of the small cell lung cancer can be greatly accelerated. So with this data, it actually suggests that uh, the inactivation of P53 and RB1 can actually can lead to the small cell lung cancer. 
So there's actually another piece of data from clinics to support the importance of uh, the P53 and RB activation for the small cell lung cancer. And this is actually a very interesting phenomenon. For the patient who are started, for the patient who are started with a non-small cell lung cancer uh, with uh, the uh, actionable mutation, and when they were treated with a target agent such as alanib, and when uh, the you know when patient develop a recurrence, and sometimes uh, the non-small cell lung cancer actually can be converted to the small cell lung cancer. So the development of small cell lung cancer become a mechanism uh, over the drug resistance to the target therapy. So just to give one example, so this is a patient who was initially diagnosed with a lung adenocarcinoma with uh, the mutation in uh, LA58R in the EGFR. So this is a, a sensitizing mutation. So patient you know, actually can be treated with a target agent, uh, EGFR uh, inhibitor, alotinib. So patient was treated for a year and then developed a, you know, tumor recurrence and so biopsy was performed, and patient actually was found to have a small cell lung cancer, not a not non-small cell, but this time it is small cell lung cancer. And patient remains to have uh, the mutation of the EGFR, suggesting that uh, so this uh, small cell lung cancer is actually coming from the, the same clone that leads to the, the non-small cell lung cancer initially. So patient was treated with uh, chemotherapy and the radiation, and, and then was put back on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, EGFR inhibitor allotment. And eventually patient developed a resistance to uh, the, both uh, the uh, allotment and uh, had a recurrence. So then this, is a, this time it becomes resistant to the, the original chemotherapy for the small cell lung cancer. Then patient was uh, treated with uh, both uh, radiation, uh, with uh, the chemotherapy, as well as target agent alanib, as stand for E here. And eventually, uh, because uh, at this moment, uh, the tumors were resistant to this treatment, and then patient eventually uh, passed away and had an autopsy done. So here I just show the, the genetic features of uh, different tumors uh, of this patient. As you can see here, this is actually the non-small cell lung cancer tumors the patient has. So patient has uh, this, uh, the activating mutation of the EGFR. And because the patient developed a secondary mutation of the EGFR, it's called the T790M mutation. And patient become resistant to the uh, initial uh, the EGFR inhibitor allotinib. So if you look at uh, the other genes, uh, status. So uh, for the P53, there, there is a, a, a deletion in one allele, but the other allele is a Y type. And for the other tumors, one is uh, in lung, the other one is in the liver. So those are small cell lung cancer. And you can see that uh, those tumors also uh, 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 the, remains to have a EGFR mutation. Again, it's, it, it tells you that uh, these are coming from the same clone that developed, that leads to the non-small cell lung cancer. And then you can, you can find that uh, there is also the deletion in one allele of the P53, and the, uh, the other allele actually is lost due to the loss of, uh, loss of heterozygosity. So this is present in both the uh, tumors in the lung and the liver. And through the meantime, uh, these researchers also uh, checked the expression level of the RB by using the immunohistochemical scanning. So the data actually is listed here. So as they actually compared between the tumor uh, before the uh, target therapy and uh, the tumor that, uh, that uh, progressed after the target therapy. You know, if you just look through, you can see that uh, Wherever there's a, you know, the neuroendocrine uh, features that suggest that uh, this is a small cell lung cancer, you can see there's a negative uh, RB. So meaning that the RB uh, is, it was also lost in those uh, the, uh, recurrent tumors with uh, neuroendocrine features. 
So again, it shows that uh, the loss of uh, P53 and RB are very critical for the development of the small cell lung cancer. So this finding actually is uh, further corroborated by the, the sequencing data of the small cell lung cancer. So in this study, uh, the research researchers actually did uh, the uh, whole genome sequencing uh, of uh, over 100 uh, small cell lung cancer specimens. So they actually didn't really find any uh, mutations that can be targeted with the existing medication. However, what they found is that uh, first they found that P53 and RB1 are mutated in over 90 and 80% uh, of the patients respectively. So this is, again, confirmed the previous finding. And second of all, they found that uh, the epigenetic genes such as uh, P300 and uh, the CRAB BP, uh, both genes actually uh, encode for the histone acetyltransferase, which actually uh, kind of modify the histones and regulate the gene exp uh, expression. So this occurred in about 15% of the patients. And uh, another interesting finding is that uh, the notch receptors are also uh, often mutated in the patients with uh, uh, small cell uh, lung cancer. So on the right side, which actually shows uh, de gene deletion and amplification uh, in the small cell lung cancer uh, patients. As I mentioned earlier that uh, chromosome 3P uh, is often uh, deleted uh, in the small cell lung cancer. So as you can see that uh, here, there's a deletion. And RB and P53 are also uh, uh, deleted very frequently uh, in the small cell lung cancer. So what genes are often amplified in the small cell lung cancer? Those are the MYC family genes that include a MYC, LMYC, and also MYC. And the IRS2 is involved in the PI3 kinase pathway. So this is also often amplified. So to summarize their findings, uh, they actually found uh, these uh, four different pathways are often impact uh, in the small cell lung cancer. The first is the pathway is a cell cycle regulation. As I mentioned that P53 and RB are often uh, lost in the small cell lung cancer. And the second pathway is uh, the PI3 kinase pathway. And so uh, oftentimes uh, the PI3 uh, kinase pathway uh, is turned on uh, in the small cell lung cancer patient. And the third pathway is uh, related to the transcriptional regulation. So as I mentioned that uh, epigenetic enzymes are often inactivated and the MYC, which is a very important transcriptional regulator, are often uh, amplified in the small cell lung cancer. And the, the last pathway is actually not notch signaling pathway. So it was found that uh, notch signaling actually is uh, often uh, turned down by the mutations of uh, the notch receptor. But the significance is uh, actually addressed in the same study as well. So here, just a, you know, a very recent piece of data uh, showing you that uh, the uh, inactivation of uh, epigenetic enzyme actually can accelerate the development of the small cell lung cancer uh, in a MOS model. So in this experiment, the researcher actually added a third, uh, actually inactivated the, the, the CRAB BP uh, on top of the genetic background of uh, the uh, knockout of the RB1 and the P53. As you can see that, uh, the uh, mice with the, the triple gene uh, mutation actually develop a small cell lung cancer uh, much uh, earlier than the, the mice with only two gene mutation. And on the right side, it actually show you, this is uh, in the mice with the two gene mutation. So at the time when there's a, just a hypoplastic lesion in, in the, you know, in the triple gene mutation mice, you can already find, uh, you know, the advanced stage of uh, small cell lung cancer. So, so which suggests that uh, the, uh, the other genes besides the P53 and the RB actually can help uh, the facilitate the development of the small cell lung cancer. In this case, CRAB-BP1 does that. 
So next, I want to give you, you know, two examples about uh, the drug development in the small cell lung cancer. The first is about uh, this, uh, the antibody drug conjugate called uh, Rova-T. So as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the notch receptor uh, is often mutated uh, in the small cell lung cancer. And here is a, a cartoon to show you uh, what is uh, the notch signaling pathway. So notch receptors are actually the uh, cell membrane receptors. Uh, when the receptor binds to its ligand, which can be activating or inactivating ligand. So when it's bind to the activating ligand, then the structure of the notch receptor is uh, altered so that uh, it can be uh, cleaved by uh, gamma secretase. After cleavage, the intracellular domain of the notch receptor can actually uh, serve as a signaling molecule and migrate into the nucleus. So in the nucleus, this uh, uh, intracellular domain of the notch receptor combines to other uh, transcriptional factors and then leads to the activation of the genes. So to answer the question about the significance of a notch signaling inactivation, so researchers actually used uh, the transgenic MOS model again. So in this experiment, uh, they actually used a triple knockout um, transgenic MOS model to, uh, to generate a small cell lung cancer. So in this uh, triple knockout MOS model, they actually uh, knocked out a P53, RB, and also RB like one. And then in the second model, they actually added overexpression of uh, intracellular domain of uh, the uh, notch receptor two. In that case, uh, the notch signaling is always turned on. So what they found is that uh, in, in compared the, uh, the tumor generation be between these two different uh, MOS model, actually the, the, the strain that have uh, overexpression of uh, notch receptor two intracellular domain has a less number of uh, tumors in the lung. And also, uh, if, if you look at uh, the surface area of the lung uh, impact by the tumor, uh, again, it shows uh, there's a less uh, tumor volume, less uh, lung volume affected by tumors uh, in, the, in the strain that have overexpression of a notch two uh, intracellular domain. And here, it shows the survival curve, and again, it showed that uh, the overexpression of uh, notch two intracellular domain actually prolonged the survival of uh, the over the over the over the animals. So again, it showed that uh, the inactivation of a notch signaling notch receptor or uh, or or turning down of the notch signaling can actually facilitate the development of uh, the small cell uh, lung cancer. All right, so during the meantime, um, uh, another group of uh, researchers uh, in California actually found that uh, the uh, one gene called the DLL3, which actually is the antagonizing ligand of the notch receptor, is often expressed, overexpressed in the small cell lung cancer. So what's shown here is that uh, compared to the normal lung, in the no small cell lung cancer tumors, uh, and also cell lines, you can see that the expression of uh, the DLL3 is, uh, is actually two log, about a one and a half log higher than the, uh, the expression of DLL3 in a normal lung. And as I mentioned that uh, the um, turning down the notch signaling actually uh, facilitated the development of the small cell lung cancer. And this uh, DLL3 uh, is a, uh, is an antagonizing ligand. So overexpression of this ligand help to turn down the notch signaling. So how can we use this information to develop a therapy? So the, actually this uh, group of researchers had an idea to uh, develop an antibody drug conjugate because uh, this protein is a, uh, is a cell surface protein. So you actually can use the antibody to target or binds to uh, these, uh, the surface receptor. And so what they did is uh, they actually uh, linked a, a very toxic chemo drug. And here we call it the payload. 
uh, linked with uh, antibodies that can recognize the uh, DLL3 on the cell surface. So they give the name called the robot T. So the idea is that uh, the antibody can, uh, can lead the drug to the tumor cells. And because uh, the chemo drug itself is pretty toxic, which you cannot really give in the patients uh, uh, without a visa mechanism, because that just be too toxic to the patient. But in this case, uh, because it's uh, actually guided by the antibody, so you can give a very small amount, but the, the drug actually will be enriched at the tumor site. And in this case, uh, a very toxic drug can actually can effectively uh, kill the tumor cells. So what they found is that uh, in the animal model, for example, take this as an example. So the tumor was treated with uh, uh, the first line chemotherapy, in this case, uh, cisplatin with a, a top site. The tumor volume decreased, but over time, tumor developed a resistance. If you don't treat it, these animals, which was represented as a black curve, the tumor volume continued to increase. However, if you treat it with the antibody drug conjugate with, you know, in three doses, you, have to, you can see a very, you know, shrinkage of the tumor and, uh, and also the, the shrinkage of tumor can last uh, over about three months. And on the right, hand side, and they actually did a comparison. So how about you retreated these mice who develop a re resistance to the initial chemotherapy? And you can find that uh, although the tumor size decreased uh, again, but, uh, but it appeared uh, faster than the first round of the chemotherapy. So that's a, this is the point they want to make is that uh, this antibody drug conjugate is actually is better than the chemotherapy. So this drug actually was tested in the clinical trial, and because of, for the interest of time, I will just kind of briefly mention about these. So they actually said that patients who uh, progressed after the first line chemotherapy as well as uh, the first two lines of therapy, and they stratified patients based on the expression level of the DIL3. So majority patients have uh, uh, you know, at least uh, some expression uh, in uh, some of the tumor cells. And uh, there's also about a two thirds of patients who have uh, uh, expression of DL3 in um, more than 50% of the tumor cells. So this is uh, the waterfall plot, which shows the best response of the tumors uh, to the, this type of drugs. Uh, you can see that uh, um, here, they use a color to represent the expression level of the DL3. So the patient who have uh, the uh, the bar below this uh, dotted line are considered to have a response, meaning this is, means the, uh, the tumors have a more than 30% of a shrinkage. So you can see that many of these have uh, are, many of these bars are actually in green color, which represent that they have uh, the DL3 expression level more than 50%. And there's also a couple of patients with a light green bar, which are uh, no available data of the DL3. So, which does make sense that a patient who have a higher expression of the target can uh, are more likely to have a response to the treatment. So, this is uh, the data showing the uh, the rate of uh, objective response, meaning that a tumor has a significant shrinkage, uh, versus a clinical benefit rate, meaning that uh, uh, there's a no uh, no progression of the tumor uh, on this treatment. Uh, as you can see that uh, the patients with a uh, uh, high expression of the biomarker, but in this case greater than 50%, have a better chance to have a, a response. And also these patients have a better chance of uh, clinical benefits as well. So this trial actually was initially done in the phase one, and later the drug actually was acquired by the uh, AppV. So they actually they initiated a phase two trial and actually, they just recently um, uh, released the data of the phase two trial. And the phase two trial result actually is a little bit disappointing. Uh, the data actually didn't uh, repeat the finding in the phase one. So in this case, uh, in the patients with uh, uh, high expression of the DL3, they only find 16% uh, of a response rate compared to the previously uh, 39%. So, you know, this is probably because of uh, the uh, different patient population. 
uh, the company actually is trying to see whether uh, these drugs can be combined with uh, other drugs uh, in the first line or the second line study. So next I will talk about the immune therapy in the small cell lung cancer. So immune therapy uh, is a very hot at this moment. So there also has been many attempts to, to testing this, this class of drugs in the small cell lung cancer. So immune therapy actually come with uh, different flavors. So there could be vaccine, there could be antibody drug conjugates. They also can be just uh, so-called uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what I will focus on here is uh, to talk about uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so the tumors uh, can develop in uh, patients because the uh, immune system cannot uh, really tell the difference between tumor cells and uh, the normal cells. So the way the tumor cells does that is uh, they actually overexpress uh, some of uh, the proteins such as the, the PDL1, um, the program that's the ligand one, which just to tell the immune system that uh, you know I'm 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 self don't attack me. So the principle of the checkpoint inhibitors is to use uh, the uh, the antibody to uh, really interrupt the binding between the uh, PDL1 with uh, the PD1 on the immune cells, so that uh, the will unmask the tumor cells, so that the immune system can recognize the tumors. So there are actually there are many other molecules uh, on the tumor cells that uh, can mediate the immune suppression. Uh, so uh, if so what's uh, relevant to uh, this talk is uh, this uh, CTLA-4, uh, which is also uh, is, uh, expressed in the uh, tumor and the, the immune cells that can turn down the uh, immune activation. So, you know, the, so in order to have an immune response, so you need to have an immune cells, but meantime, immune cells need to be able to tell that a tumor cells is different from uh, the normal cells. So the way it does is that uh, and it, the tumor cells often have a mutation. So it may express protein that's different from the normal cells. And this is how the immune uh, cells can pick it up and then be able to tell this is uh, different from uh, its normal cells. So here is a very famous graph, which just show uh, the tumor mutation burdens in different types of the tumors. And I would just want to point out that uh, the small cell lung cancer is actually considered as a tumor type with a high mutation burden. So oftentimes the tumors that are caused by the smoking or in this case melanoma, which is caused by the UV lights, tends to have a, a higher mutation burden. So usually, you know, when tumor have a higher mutation burden, so it's more likely to express a protein that's different from itself. So it's, it's more likely to be picked up by the immune system and so that I have an immune response. So the expression of, of the pd one in the small cell lung cancer is actually is not a very high. And also the expression of the pd one is often on the immune cells instead of the tumor cells which actually pose a little bit of question whether immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor will be effective in these type of tumors. Uh, during the meantime, the genetic study, study actually found that uh, in, some, uh, in a very small number of the patients, there is uh, the uh, amplification of uh, the PDL1. So here it actually shows the two uh, patient samples compared to uh, 75 patients without amplification. You can see that uh, CD274 stands for the PDL1. So there's a, a very, there's a gene amplification, very significant increase of uh, the gene expression. And this actually is uh, also uh, corroborated by the immunohistochemical standing showing in those uh, brown colors that uh, PDL1s are overexpressed in these tumors with the gene amplification. So in the clinical trial, uh, I will just skip these uh, slides, that a, a patient actually was tested to be treated with a, just a single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors versus uh, uh, the, uh, the combination of uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So in this case, there are the inhibitors targeting pd one and also epilumab is the inhibitor that targets 
uh, the, uh, the CTLA-4. Uh, so again, they stratify the patient based on the expression of the PD-L1. Again, the expression of the PD-L1 is pretty low. It's only about a 14 to 24 uh, percent in the patients. So what they found is that uh, for the single agent, uh, in the patients not stratified based on the PD-L1 expression, there's only 10 percent of patients who have a, a partial response. And if you combine the two uh, checkpoint inhibitors, the response rate can be doubled to about 20 percent. And however, the, uh, the com combinatory checkpoint inhibitor treatments are not so benign because uh, they're actually there are much higher toxicity and there could be you know some other uh, some immune related uh, the uh, adverse adverse events such as the pneumonitis and also the uh, encephalopathy caused by the activation of the immune system. So uh, currently, this is still uh, the combinatory immune checkpoint inhibitors treatment hasn't been approved by the FDA as they're waiting for more uh, data. So what I want to point out is that, uh, uh, you know, in a retrospective analysis of the clinical specimen, and actually it was found that a patient with a, a higher mutation burden tends to have a better chance to respond to the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Which does make sense that uh, you know more mutations suggest that uh, there are more uh, new antigens to be recognized by the immune system. As shown here, this is the blue represent a single agent, and the orange represent uh, the uh, the double agents. So you can see that uh, in the patient with high mutation burden, so there's a, a much uh, higher uh, response rate uh, in the patient who got a single agent uh, versus a double agent. Uh, actually, this topic will be further discussed in the next week's uh, uh, lecture. So finally, I just want to touch a little bit about the extrapulmonary small cell carcinoma. So uh, besides lung, in, uh, you know, small cell carcinoma can also occur in other organ systems, such as the prostate and uh, bladder and also and head and neck tumors. And compared to small cell lung cancer, the incidence of uh, the actual pulmonary small cell carcinoma is uh, much lower. So there's not too much uh, uh, you know, experience on those tumors. And the first line therapy is actually borrowed from the uh, small cell lung cancer. It's also the cis plotting or couple plotting with the etoxide uh, doublet. So one distinction is that uh, the actual pulmonary small cell lung cancer is not uh, as likely to metastasize to the brain as a small cell lung cancer. Um, so the only exception is uh, the prostate cancer and prostate small cell lung, small cell cancer and the head and neck small cell cancer. Uh, these are two are still likely to express, spread to the brain. So for those two, you may still want to consider about a prophylactic uh, uh, cranial irradiation. Just to summarize, uh, uh, in this lecture, I mentioned that a small cell lung cancer is a, a recalcitrant cancer, and we need a more uh, therapy uh, for this type of cancer. And as you may remember that a P53 and a RB1 are often mutated uh, in the small cell lung cancer. And finally, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor has been recently approved for the treatment of a small cell lung cancer in the third line study. And actually, uh, due to the time issue, I did, didn't get a chance to mention about the other novel agents that are currently being developed, but more are coming. All right, thank you. Um, and I uh, would like to take some questions if you have any. That's a very interesting question. So there are actually, there are some unpublished data which uh, suggests that, uh, uh, you know, in the small cell lung cancer, most of the tumor have a neuroendocrine feature, but there's also a small number of the tumors which do not have a neuroendocrine uh, feature. So the, actually uh, it was uh, uh, reported in one of uh, the um, conference that uh, the uh, small cell lung cancer without a neuroendocrine feature tends to have
have a high expression of the PDL1. So they are more likely to respond to the checkpoint inhibitor, but the clinical data is still lacking. All right, thank you. Have a good evening.